Welcome, everybody. We're going to start this session. Um, grateful to be with all of you. Thanks for joining us in the room and online. Uh, this is the Open Forum on Technology and Human Rights Due Diligence at the UN. Hope you're all in the right place. If you're not, please stay anyway. Um, it's great to have you here, a very important topic. Um, I want to start off by thanking our co-organizers. I'm Peggy Hicks of the UN's Human Rights Office in Geneva. Um, but I see with us uh, Peter Misik from Access Now, grateful for your support, um, as well as from the uh, European External Action Service, EU, um, and the Republic of Korea, who all contributed to this session. Um, just a, a brief overview of what we're trying to accomplish today. Uh, we want to, uh, we're talking about a, a document that's been in the works for a while, uh, a very necessary document, one that looks at how the UN itself brings human rights due diligence into our approach to digital technologies. And this is, of course, crucial not only because as an international organization that's active across the globe in, in many different spheres, it's, it's an important thing for the UN to get right. Um, but our hope, of course, is that uh, by really focusing in on this issue at the UN, we'll be able to, to set down some, some guidance that would be useful to others in this, in this field as well. So this is an interagency process that's been underway for some time, and we're now in, I think that's the third draft that we're going to be talking about today of, of the guidance, but we're, we're nearing the close and, and really saw this opportunity at the IGF as a place to, to make sure that we are getting the, the types of input on this and to make um, really sort of a public engagement around this document, which is so important. So what we'll, we'll do today is we're going to provide a summary of some of the comments that we've received from shareholders on this latest version three of the Human Rights Due Diligence document for the UN. Um, we're gonna share the, the views from uh, our end, the UN Human Rights Office, on, on those comments, and we you know, wanna have an open discussion both on the document and on the comments that are there. Um, in, and we'll also update everybody on where, where it's heading. Uh, we're, we have with us today online uh, Katie Chavin, the consultant who's been working with our office on this, and the lead drafter along with Scott Campbell, who heads our digital tech and human rights work at uh, OHCHR. And we are going to be joined online by Nicholas Okshot, uh, senior policy officer at UNHCR. We're hoping to have with us in the room Victor Capillo from Kicknet uh, Anet, uh, a Kenyan-based uh, multi-stakeholder think tank on ICT policy formulation. Hope he finds the room and joins us soon. Um, and then finally, uh, the UN's uh, tech uh, envoy, uh, Amandeep Singh Gill, will join us near the uh, later in the session and, and make some comments near the, the end of the session. So very happy to have you all with us. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Scott Great. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Peggy. And um, hope you're hearing me okay uh, in the room there in Addis. So I'll um, take that as a, a green light. Um, but thanks to everybody for um, for attending. It's it's clear that with the number of parallel sessions going on at DIGF, it is really challenging to to prioritize. Um, very happy that we're having you know this next uh, public consultation uh, and a multi-stakeholder consultation uh, on the, the draft guidance. Um, I really want to thank all, all those that have been involved in giving us um, very constructive feedback uh, and thoughtful feedback um, to date throughout the various consultations that, that, we, that we've had. Um, I mean, Peggy, as you noted, it, it has been a, it's been an extended process. Um, and in fact, that, and I, I did want to say just a couple words uh, about the process. Uh, the first thing is just that it's been very useful uh, on a number of fronts. And I think in particular, um, building mutual understanding among really a, a diverse group of actors within the UN and outside the UN on what human rights due diligence actually means and what applying that to how the UN is using digital tech, what that means in practice as well. So we, we've really learned enormously, we as the UN Human Rights Office, in going through this process, and we're, we're hopeful it's been a, a mutual learning process for, for many involved. Um, linked with that, is our determination just to, to make this guidance really practical, uh, useful, uh, and used. Uh, and so we are indeed going through this rather extended process to make sure um, people understand it, people have buy-in, people understand what it means, what it doesn't mean in terms of actually 
implementing uh, within the respective UN mandates, which of course are, are extremely varied across across the UN system. Um, as Peggy noted, so we have taken into account uh, the written comments received in September and October on our third draft. Thanks again uh, to all who've contributed. We'll share thoughts. I'll hand over to Katie in, uh, in just a minute um, for her to uh, give a summary of the feedback that we have heard and how we're considering uh, incorporating that in the next version. Um, we will subsequently share with you a fourth version um, for your consideration as well. We're very happy, as we have been along the way and have done, to enter into, into further consultations as need be. Um, while we do hope to bring the, this process to, um, you know, to a close uh, in the first part of next year. Uh, in terms of the specific timing and endorsement bodies, um, we will ultimately share uh, a revised version uh, of the draft guidance with the executive committee uh, of the secretary general, which is the senior most internal um, internal facing committee uh, under the secretary general, and we'll submit it to, to that body for endorsement. Uh, and then the secretary general um, may ultimately decide to share it with the chief executives board uh, of the United Nations for their, their endorsement. The exact, I think just a final note is the exact timing of when we share it uh, with the executive committee of the secretary generals is tied to a parallel internal process uh, that is ongoing and also relates to human rights due diligence. Um, and in short, this is a process um, whereby the Secretariat is looking at the existing human rights due diligence policy, which applies more narrowly uh, to UN support to non-UN security forces, something that has been in, in uh, implementation phase for over a decade now. Um, and that process is currently under review to see how that policy might be expanded more broadly across the UN. So our process, uh, of course, which looks at more specific guidance on human rights due diligence in the UN's use of technology will essentially build on that that broader policy uh, that will be um, uh, that will hopefully be uh, forthcoming uh, after a meeting of the uh, exec executive committee in the first quarter of, of next year. But we are just to to assure people, and this is a question that has come up, that the two the development of this guidance and the development of that broader policy are very much uh, aligned, both in substance. Uh, and in timing. Uh, and just maybe a last note, um, we do uh, envision once um, once the guidance uh, has been endorsed, we do envision uh, an extensive rollout process and guiding UN agencies, uh, um, programs and funds, UN country teams and entities in the field uh, on how exactly uh, the, the guidance can be implemented, um, doing webinars, developing tools uh, and resources uh, to facilitate the implementation. So, uh, Peggy, with that, I'll uh, I'll hand it uh, hand it back to you, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thanks very much, Scott, um, and uh, that's that's a great overview of where we've been and where we're headed. And now yeah. we're going to turn directly to Katie uh, there with you for an overview of the feedback received and how we're uh, incorporating those comments so far, and of the document itself in a, in a general sense. One hopes. Over to you, Katie. Thank you very much, Peggy. It's great to be here today and have an opportunity to share some observations about the feedback we've received on the second draft of the, the third draft of the due diligence guidance. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm supporting this project as a consultant to the UN Human Rights Office and very briefly to just give you some context regarding my perspective in, in analysing what we've been hearing from those who've reviewed the guidance. Uh, I'm a business and human rights specialist. Uh, I've been immersed in this field for nearly 15 years, initially as a, a lawyer providing pro bono support to, to John Muggy and his team as they developed the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. But for the past 10 years, I've worked primarily with business practitioners supporting practical peer learning on, on how to implement human rights due diligence in complex organisations. Before I dive into the feedback that we received on the third draft, um, I want to provide just a little bit of information um, about kind of what the guidance looks like for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, very briefly, it's a 17-page document that includes um, an introduction to so that provides high-level information about the guidance, including why it has been developed, who it's for, and and how to use it. Um, it then introduces human rights due diligence for digital technology use, what that is and um, why UN entities uh, should do it. 
the main substance of the guidance is then set out in a more detailed third section that addresses practical approaches to implementing human rights due diligence for digital technology use, uh, including um, embedding human rights due diligence um, across an organisation, um, steps to identify and assess impacts, uh, the action that should be taken um, where potential or actual human rights impacts are, are identified, um, and then processes to track progress and effectiveness, um, as well as to communicate about the organisation's approach. Uh, the guidance then concludes with um, a frequently asked question section that anticipates and addresses some common questions about the guidance, um, picking up really on, on some of the questions that we're, we're getting through this review process. Um, and it also provides links to further resources that may be helpful to UN entities as, as they embark on, on implementing it. Turning to the feedback that we received, um, we received comments from 15 stakeholders on, on this third draft, um, mainly from within the UN system, but also from other stakeholder groups. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that we received less feedback on, on this draft than uh, the previous one, and that we saw generally positive reactions to the direction the guidance is currently heading in. Um, I think it's also important to emphasise that the feedback was incredibly constructive, thoughtful and welcome and has been hugely helpful as we start work on the fourth draft. There are several substantive areas of feedback um, that I'd like to share with you today. As, as you might imagine, we, we received a wide range of, of comments, but I want to really highlight and, and focus in on um, the key things. Uh, firstly, and to begin on a, a positive note, um, a number of stakeholders um, welcomed the direction that the draft is now taking and really emphasise it, that it's helpful that the, the draft itself um, emphasises the iterative nature of human rights due diligence and the need for approaches to human rights due diligence to be tailored to the context of, of each UN entity and, and the flexibility they have to design a process that works for them um, and also the, the sort of plainness and accessibility uh, of the language and in, in reducing kind of barriers to engaging with the content in the guidance. We heard that this helped take uh, a lot of the anxiety out of um, discussions uh, internally with, within different entities and, and really helped focus minds on what operationalizing it might look like instead. Uh, when developing this third draft, we, we really thought about how to frame the guidance to do exactly that, building on some of the feedback we heard um, on the second draft. So it was really positive to hear that, for the most part, that approach resonated with those who reviewed it. Secondly, structure. Um, a number of reviewers commented that some of the introductory material felt quite repetitive and that some key concepts included in the body of the guidance would have been much more helpful uh, earlier on. So, for example, we received a lot of comments in the um, earlier sections of the guidance that highlighted questions or confusion about the expected scope of entities' human rights due diligence for digital technology use, which was addressed later in the document in a box that sets out ways an entity can be involved in human rights impacts and the action that it should take. Um, that feedback has been very helpful and we're now looking at some changes to the structure that we can make to ensure that that kind of key information about um, the human rights implications of digital technology use, the scope of human rights due diligence come much earlier on. Um, and also that we communicate very, very clearly um, that the guidance encompasses the full life cycle of digital technology use, starting with conception and design. We're also working on some uh, options to streamline some of that introductory content and um, help people get into the, the meat of the guidance uh, faster. Uh, thirdly, um, we received uh, a lot of feedback on the second draft um, about the need to better align the guidance on prioritisation with the approach um, taken in the UN's existing human rights due diligence policy, which focuses on grave violations. Um, and the feedback there was directed to ensuring some consistency um, with, with existing policies and, and this guidance. In the third draft, we sought to um, build on, on that feedback and include uh, guidance on prioritisation that both focuses on severity and aligns with international standards like the UNGPs, but also incorporates uh, a minimum threshold focused on grave violations to align with uh, existing policies. Um, with this third draft, we then received actually very helpful um, feedback from one entity in particular that on reflection, it might actually be more straightforward to simply focus in this guidance on 
a risk-based approach to prioritization uh, focused on severity and then leave entities to ensure that they are doing that in a way that um, aligns with other relevant policies uh, that they need to, to comply with, including the existing human rights due diligence policy. Um, I think this is, is likely to be reflected in, in the next draft. Fourth, um, use of leverage. We also received helpful feedback that the guidance would benefit from um, practical examples of what using leverage to um, encourage third parties uh, to act would, would really look like in practice. Um, this is something that uh, we shied away from in the third draft, mainly because uh, I was conscious that it was already becoming significantly longer than the second draft, um, and I wanted to, to uh, avoid it getting uh, any longer. But um, you reflecting on the feedback we've received, um, uh, we agree that it, it could be really helpful to include some of those examples. And certainly from my experience working with business and, and other organisations grappling with, with human rights due diligence, um, I know that the use of leverage can be one of the more challenging areas of human rights due diligence um, for, for organisations to get their heads around, particularly when it comes to going beyond traditional commercial leverage. So we're looking at ways to do this that are useful, practical, and also don't overcomplicate uh, the guidance. Uh, fifth, um, we asked stakeholders for input on the value of including some illustrative examples throughout the guidance. Um, we also asked them for suggestions or requests in terms of the types of scenarios or types of digital technology um, use or digital technology related human rights risks um, it would be particularly helpful to um, address. All stakeholders who commented on this agreed that examples would be very helpful, uh, and a number of them have also offered some concrete suggestions which will help us to flesh out some examples that really resonate with the types of uh, issues and challenges that we understand entities are, are grappling with right now. And then finally, um, carve-outs. Uh, in relation to the second draft, we received a number of requests for um, carve-outs, so effectively sort of exemptions from having to do prior human rights due diligence, particularly from entities that engage in very urgent or, or life-saving work who were concerned about the implications um, for, for that very important work of a potentially onerous due diligence process. In the third draft, we took care to really emphasise the flexibility that entities have to tailor how they do human rights due diligence to ensure that it works with their activities and, and the context in which they operate. Um, that, I think, resonated um, with uh, at least some of the stakeholders who expressed such concerns, and we received um, feedback that the, the approach the guidance now takes um, has been helpful in, in alleviating some worry about what the kind of practical input implications um, of it might be for, for their work. Um, we're continuing to explore these concerns though with, with those stakeholders um, and also to look at options to develop a worked example that illustrates um, how human rights due diligence might be implemented in relation to urgent or life-saving work in a way that navigates those tensions or challenges in, in a rights-respecting way. So those were the six key areas of feedback that I wanted to share with you today. And as I went along, uh, I flagged some of our current thoughts on on how those um, areas of feedback might be addressed in the next draft. As I mentioned, and I really want to emphasize this, the, the feedback has been invaluable and we're so grateful to those who took the time to, to share thoughts with us, some of whom really uh, invested um, effort in um, extensive internal uh, consultation and socialization processes within their entities to be able to give us um, the most helpful steer uh, for, for the next draft. When we took um, when we developed the third draft, we, we took stock of, of some of the helpful but challenging feedback and, and really rethought how we approached it. And the, the third draft looks very different from the second draft. Um, this time, the feedback was generally supportive of the approach that we've taken and, and really looking at how we can refine that and make sure it's um, a, as helpful to entities as, as possible. Um, accordingly, I, I think that the fourth draft will, will build on the third but is unlikely to be um, radically or significantly different. Um, that's probably quite a lot for me to get this conversation started. So I'll hand back to Peggy, but I really welcome any questions or comments when we open up the discussion, as well as further feedback or suggestions, which we will take into consideration as we prepare the next draft. 
Great, thanks very much, Katie. And I, I guess it's a, a good moment for me to also very much thank Katie, whose services and work on this have been invaluable. And as you can, I'm sure, hear from her comments, has approached it with a wealth of ex expertise and experience. And 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 uh, most, even potentially more importantly, an attitude of problem solving and trying to really listen and and incorporate uh, the the valuable feedback that we've gotten. So thanks very much, Katie and and Scott, for all your work on this. Um, so, as I said, we wanted to have a couple of general comments going forward and then open it up for questions from, from and uh, comments from all of you. Um, I'm very grateful that I've been joined by Victor um, now for, uh, and, and really looking forward uh, to, to his work. I, as I said earlier, he works at Kick the Net, is that, I'm saying it correctly? Great. Um, a multi-stakeholder think tank for ICT pol policy formulation and really uh, welcome your, your thoughts on this initiative, Victor. Maybe. Yes, um, thank you very much for the opportunity and I, I want to thank the team that has um, worked on you know, the, the document and the drafts so far to incorporate um, the views of stakeholders. Um, I believe it's very important uh, that institutions such as the UN is starting to take action. Uh, we have been focusing a lot on companies but uh, we hadn't started looking inside. Uh, to see what more could be done from uh, the single largest human rights institution that is important to start leading by example. Um, just in terms of a uh, quick response to some comments to um, the draft, I think um, so far it, um, it has made very pro good progress from what has been said. I think um, from some issues just for me is um, one is how um, can we um, uh, implement in terms of uh, engagement with suppliers because I think procurement is the number one uh, biggest area that's where we start and that's how we engage um, you know is it possible to have um, stronger requirements of uh, you know suppliers um, in terms of demonstrating their human rights um, compliance uh, you know in terms of whether they are sending the reports and things like that as part of the process um, how can we put in place measures to look at uh, how to assess the unintended consequences uh, and effects uh, of technology? Sometimes in the assessment we might have um, we might have been thinking this way, but uh, these things change or circumstances change that create uh, impact that were not uh, intended. Um, and also just uh, from the continent, are we also looking at how the technology impacts the groups at risk, who are already at risk? Uh, so perhaps the guidance could elaborate a bit more uh, the special groups, if you're looking at refugees, children, um, those are sp specific special categories of groups who are adversely affected that perhaps it would be useful to have some more consideration. And. Um, then we have um, um, the aspect of, uh, you know, reporting. Um, how can we elaborate more on the communication aspect? Because as civil society, we'd like to engage and see how the UN is implementing the measures, but how, um, what measures could be put in place to require the various agencies to collect data, statistics, and provide information on even the types of technology that they are provide that they adopting, the suppliers that they are engaging with, and so that we can also track. Uh, we can't, um, uh, you know, monitor the progress uh, at the UN if we don't know what they are using and how they are using it. So perhaps an elaboration more on that would also be useful. And I think the the aspect on preparation. I know it had just been mentioned that uh, there is going to be a series of webinars and and things like that, perhaps also within the guidance to um, help the various agencies also to start taking measures to prepare by, um, as a first process to educate their teams on why this is important and why it's important to do it over and above, um, over and above the document. And I think um, lastly is that we know that there are various types of technologies that are already in use. Um, perhaps an elaboration on which um, technologies are these that perhaps the institutions will start um, thinking about them more clearly about how you know we are using artificial intelligence you know biometrics and so on and so forth perhaps more elaboration on um, the, 
the dangers that these uh, technologies pose. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Victor. That, uh, a wealth of, of really helpful insights and comments there. And, and I love the way that you started off by, by, by noting that it's one of the things I think we, uh, within these discussions, always need to look at is the, the multiple actors in the space and how they all um, have human rights uh, responsibilities of different kinds. So we do focus a lot, as you said, on the companies. Uh, the UN itself has roles, and then of course there's the state role, both within the UN guiding principles and, and more generally to fulfill human rights obligations in this space. So we ought to also be asking the same questions of states about their human rights due diligence processes for their own use of digital technologies. So again, we hope that this, this effort and the, the public consultations and the broad ranged engagement around it will allow us to, to set some good practices in place for it. And, and I, I appreciated all your comments, but also wanted to just pick up on, on the note about you know, this tension between trying to make sure that, that what happens here is seen as a process in which people want to invest time. Um, because people are very busy and they need to, um, you know, do the jobs that they, that are so crucial. Uh, all UN partners have that in mind, and wanting to to make sure we're communicating effectively about how this can be done efficiently, but also why it ultimately delivers val value. Why it's not, you know, an additional hurdle to get over, but something that can help with delivery of of effective programming in a variety of ways. Um, so we have one other uh, commentator that we wanted to bring in, and then I'll open it up to, to comments from the floor as well, and I know we have a couple lined up already. Um, and then obviously, ultimately, want to go back to, to Katie and, and Scott for some reflections too. Um, but I'd like to turn the floor next to Nicholas uh, Oakshoot from UNHCR. Really looking forward to your thoughts, Nicholas. Many thanks, Peggy, and also to the other organizers for uh, inviting UNHCR to take part in this session. Uh, I'd like to start by saying how greatly appreciated um, the thought and care that's gone into the consultations in developing the gardens thus far is from our side, and we welcome the careful consideration that's been given to our comments. We think that the third draft is well on the way to providing, you know, what Scott and Katie identified, also Peggy at the top of the important practical and implementable guidance within the UN. Let me start by saying why um, this guidance is particularly important for UNHCR. It aligns with key elements of our uh, new digital transformation strategy, which runs from this year until 2026. And this strategy is different from many other digital transformation strategies because it's focused primarily on transforming the digital lives of the people we serve in a rights respecting and protection enhancing way, uh, as well as how UNHCR's own organizational transformation can, um, can support that overall objective. The strategy contains important commitments on ethics, uh, what we're terming digital protection and strengthening digital mechanisms for our own accountability to affected populations. And for example, the, the section on digital protection includes an important commitment, namely that UNHCR's own use of digital technology will continue to increase protection and align with international human rights and ethical standards, and that these standards will also be promoted with states and the private sector with a focus on high-risk technologies, uses, and contexts. So we see that the, the finalization and future implementation of the guidance alongside other developing UN internal standards, such as the ethical principles on the use of artificial intelligence in the UN system, which were adopted by the Chief Executives Board in September of this year, can provide an important framework to help realize those uh, strategic commitments contained within our strategy. And this lines up well, we think, with you know, broader UN organizational commitments on the within the roadmap on digital cooperation, the Secretary General's call to action for human rights, and also, of course, the digital components of the, the common agenda. Um, turning now, if I may, to some of the, the challenges that, that, that we see in, in respect of the guidance, its development and implementation, and how to, to address them. 
UNHCR is obviously a humanitarian organization with the protection of refugees, other displaced people and the stateless at the core of its mandate. It works predominantly in challenging contexts of, of, context, of conflict and fragility with increasingly constrained resources. It fulfills an often very difficult role that depends on the widely varying capacity and willingness of host states to protect the forcibly displaced. If the UNH, if, if UNHCR were a business, these sorts of situations um, would be uh, considered as uh, meriting uh, enhanced human rights due diligence. Indeed, protection risk assessments are integral to UNHCR's work, and it has extensive risk management policies and procedures in a wide range of areas which are related to digital tech. Um, so, for example, data protection, procurement, um, digital technology partnerships. However, human rights due diligence itself is comparatively new to the organization. As a result, in our responses to the drafts, we've carefully analyzed how the guidance can strengthen UNHCR's existing approaches to, to quote from the Human Rights Council in the conception, design, use, development, and further deployment of digital technology. At the same time, we're concerned to ensure that the guidance doesn't inadvertently impede the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance in accordance with humanitarian principles, this point that, that Katie has flagged up. But what does that mean in practice? Well, for example, Concerns have been raised about whether a human rights impact assessment will be required for the use of digital technology prior to every emergency response with the risk that it would slow down uh, its it's thought the delivery of life-saving humanitarian assistance. Similarly, in some strain contexts, UNHCR may face stark choices between using a particular technology or working with a particular partner or supplier on the one hand or on the other hand, not delivering that humanitarian life-saving assistance. So how does UNHCR propose to move forward in its engagement in the final stages in the development and adoption of the guidance and, and address some of these uh, remaining concerns in more detail? Well, the third draft itself provides a helpful clue in suggesting that, and I'm quoting here, uh, if the UN entity is new to human rights due diligence, steps to get started should, should include desktop research and conversations with internal or external stakeholders or an internal workshop to learn about key human rights risks and issues relating to the entity's digital technology use. With this in mind, UNHCR secured some additional funding to undertake an internal simulation of the guidance and has formed a multifunctional stakeholder group team internally to prepare it and to support our engagement with the, the future development. To learn from the private sector, um, we have, uh, we're grateful to have secured the expert support for the simulation from human rights due diligence experts at the responsible business team in DLA Piper, a multinational law firm. This is part of a much wider uh, partnership between UNHCR and DLA Piper over the next three years that was launched on World Refugee Day uh, this year, which includes extensive pro bono commitment and funding for uh, uh, Refugee Environmental Protection Fund. In addition, we're looking to uh, other UN experts on human rights due diligence to see if they can support this simulation of the implementation of the guidance. Um, we hope that by looking at case studies and the challenging context in which uh, UNHCR often works um, to build our own capacity, provide recommendations on some of the difficult questions that I flagged up already, um, and also to think about how we can best bring the communities we serve into the future implementation of the guidance. That's another key uh, principle that's, uh, that's contained within our digital transformation strategy. Um, one final thought in closing is that I very much echo the, the thoughts of, of Katie and Scott that the process of the development of the guidance has been very helpful to UNHCR because it's uh, allowed us as an entity to think through how uh, human rights due diligence and uh, in relation to digital technology can help us to meet our strategic goals and strengthen our own risk management processes. And I think that although we're at the start of this process, um, we very much welcome the opportunity that the uh, guidance development has given to build momentum in this area. So thank you very much and look forward to the further conversations and, and discussion. Over back to, to the room in Addis. 
Great. Thank you so much, Nicholas. It's it's just really encouraging to hear from you and HCR on, on this, uh, both in terms of the, the foundation you're starting from, in terms of the digital transformation strategy that you have in place and the, the provisions within it that already reflect some of these needs and the work ongoing already ongoing with protection, risk assessments, and other tools, but then how this process can, can deepen and, and engage across uh, the broader range of human rights issues and use human rights due diligence as a, as a useful tool. And, it, and you know, in particular, the effort that you've gone through to, to put in place this simulation, I think, is, is really um, very exciting and, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing how that works and what comes out of it uh, going forward. But I, I do think, as Katie stressed at the outset, the extent to which um, this is a process, not an endpoint, and, and that whatever we do in human rights due diligence is, is an iterative uh, approach that you know, we will always need to, to refine based on what we learn from how it's working, from the involvement of different groups and, um, and engagement. And so, um, so really uh, looking to all entities to play a role, but recognizing that that will vary um, in different ways um, over time. So, um, so with that, I, I'd love to turn to, to all of you listening um, as part of this conversation and gather some more comments and, and thoughts on the conversation that we've had so far. And I have notes that uh, we have two people in the room, I hope, uh, who are, who are uh, happy to, to come in at the outset. Um, I'd like to turn first to Susan Mawapi from Common Cause Zambia. Uh, if she's here and will it take the floor, please. And, I, and the microphone's coming from the back there for you. Susan, thank you. Thank you very much, Peggy. And um, closer to me? Is this better? OK. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, also, thank you to the previous speakers for their presentations, which were quite comprehensive. I just have two comments that I'd like to make or rather questions, actually. The first one is that um, we notice that um, most times the tech is deployed in uh, conflict areas and also areas that require desperate um, assistance. So to what extent were marginalized groups in the Global South, particularly um, women, and marginalized groups consulted in developing the guidance because most times these are the people that are affected by um, uh, this technology that is usually deployed. And then my second question is, to what extent are some of the harmful human rights practices that we, we note uh, uh, reflected in the guidance. For example, we are seeing more and more countries introducing things like digital IDs, collecting biometric information, uh, data from, from citizens. So to what extent are such reflected within the guidance? Thank you very much. Great, thanks Susan. I think that, that second point goes back to the point that Victor made as well about maybe unpacking some of the specific areas where we know there are ongoing issues, um, maybe either as case studies or annexes in, in some way too. Um, and I was also uh, hoping that we might be able to get Peter Misick from Access Now to come in with some thoughts. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're really excited about this guidance and, um, and thanks uh, to OHCHR for inviting us to participate um, throughout this process. Um, I think uh, civil society is, is really a key stakeholder um, and you know, often uh, are going to be you know, suffering the brunt of, of, of whether it's reprisals or misuse of technologies. Um, this, this guidance is really essential to the legitimacy uh, um, ongoing of the UN itself and the UN's work um, in the digital age. I think the best time to plant this seed was probably uh, at least 10 years ago. The second best time is today. Um, but, but honestly, uh, we needed this 20 years ago. Some of these policies, especially around the use of biometrics, have been in place since the early 2000s, and that's coming from the top, from the Security Council. Um, and, uh, and the harms are, you know, uh, are, have been compounding since then of, 
um, where vulnerable and marginalized communities especially um, are, are forced, you know, without any meaningful legal basis, uh, whether it's consent or otherwise, uh, to submit um, really sensitive information, uh, often to third parties and vendors, um, and, and that gets uh, misused and, and reprocessed and, and um, used against them for, for literally decades. Um, and so, you know, this, uh, this guidance is, is too late, but we're, we're trying to make sure that it's not too little. Um, this will need an ecosystem to thrive, and to use that tree analogy, um, these, these roots need to be interlocking. This can't be standing um, alone, you know, and, and suffering the, the winds. Um, and uh, linking to, to other processes, uh, many of which have been mentioned, B-Tech, B-Tech studies around business models, um, is that going to be played out uh, and, and expressed, you know, in, in the guidance or in some of the examples? Um, looking at um, data protection compliance regimes, you know, I know ICRC developed um, a really extensive regime for itself, um, but also, you know, procurement and screening processes, as Victor said, both at the UN and in member states, what are best practices, you know, existing um, in, in screenings? Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, there is mandatory human rights due diligence coming. Um, the EU is about to pass some uh, some rules. Um, how how is this going to reflect? And and really, is this going to raise a standard, or is this a floor for you know what we expect from UN agencies? Um, and then finally, you know, to, to wrap the tree analogy, this will need nourishment, and that's where civil society needs to come in. I was a little bit, um, uh, you know, dismayed not to hear much from HCR about the role of civil society and non-governmental organizations in informing their guidance, and, and this multi-stakeholder functional team sounds fairly internal, but um, from what we've seen, including the use of iris scanning technology um, on, on refugees uh, seeking assistance in Jordan, um, by HCR and, and some of their private vendors, um, you know, they're not keeping up with the, the developing norms around uh, the application of human rights to new technologies, and, uh, and, and we would say that listening to civil society could, uh, is essential in order to ensure that, and, and we agree, these norms are developing, you know, uh, the, the conversation wasn't the same in 2015 as it is now. Um, and we want to contribute to that. I will say that Access Now just yesterday at, at IGF launched um, a new declaration on uh, content governance, um, uh, principles for social media platforms, engaging in times of crisis. Um, we believe that um, you know, will apply to a lot of these humanitarian situations um, that are being discussed, but, um, but it is, as you've said, a much broader thing that will involve all UN agencies, and um, we, we're really standing by um, to, to support the, the you know, urgent need uh, for implementation here, and thank you. Great, thanks, Peter. Thanks for a, you know, a really compelling statement about why this process is, is overdue and much needed, um, and, and really looking forward to finding those avenues to make sure that the civil society process, but it's you and, and Susan both mas mentioned, are, are really the foundation for, for the work going forward. But noting, as you said, that that will require investment and resources, and, and to be frank, not 100% sure where those will come from at this stage. So I do think that's something that we all need to think about uh, going forward. Um, I, I expect we probably um, will have some comments online and in the room, but I think it makes sense quickly to give, just so we don't um, compile too many comments before we get a chance to hear back, um, to see if, if Katie uh, would like to come back in, Katie or Scott, and, and maybe uh, Nicholas might want to say a word on, on the UNHCR point that was raised as well before we turn to other questions. Katie, do you want to make some initial reflections on the comments already received? Thank you very thank much, you very Peggy, much. and sorry, we've got some microphone issues at our end. Um, thank you very much, and thank you to everyone who's who's made um, comments and, and asked questions. This has already been very helpful as we start to think about the next draft. Um, to address um, just a few of them, um, a, a number of the questions um, and comments got to the need to get really clear on, for example, you know, how um, UN entities can implement this guidance in relation to their engagement with suppliers, which we know from the experience of business and others is complicated and, and takes time and a lot of learning by doing, um, as well as to um, get into a lot of the detail around um, the risks, the types of human rights risks associated with digital technology use and, and the ways in which um, that can affect groups who are already at risk of um, 
uh, vulnerability and, and marginalization. Um, these are things that we've been thinking about quite a lot and we'll continue to think about as, as we shape the next guidance. Um, one of the things that we're conscious of is, and I think um, the last speaker put it very nicely when he talked about uh, an ecosystem um, to thrive for this guidance, it is that in order for it to be navigable and manageable, it can't do everything for everyone because it would become incredibly long. And so what we're looking at is what's already in place within the UN system or externally that we can leverage. Um, for example, there are some wonderful resources all already available that get into um, the human rights impacts of various types of digital technology use. So rather than bringing all of that detail um, into this guidance, we're looking at ways that we can um, connect uh, users of the guidance to that material that's available uh, elsewhere, whilst providing some illustrative examples that um, help uh, users to visualise what it might look like. Um, similarly, we're thinking about you know, the extent to which we can give very concrete um, guidance and support to um, entities that are looking at those more challenging areas, such as engagement with suppliers and, and the broader digital technology value chain. Um, and how we can also flag that that need to to learn by doing to work in collaboration with other organizations and to to recognize that for a lot of these um challenges there isn't a one size fits all approach we can provide a a, a high level uh that will be applicable um a, across uh different un entities but a certain amount of the work and the thinking will also need to be bespoke so trying to find ways in which we can help people navigate that with, without overwhelming them but also really leveraging in smart ways um what's already out there but also the the material that the ohchr then hopes to be able to develop to supplement this guidance and provide further support um I'm just looking at my list of questions to see if there was anything else that it's helpful okay. for me to elaborate on right now. Okay. I think perhaps the other piece would be reporting and communication. We heard, uh, apologies for the background noise, I have a, a small person um, with me who's uh, increasingly impatient. Um, we received a number of comments actually about the, the reporting and communication piece and the need to be a little bit more explicit about that and also to help entities think through what is appropriate uh, in terms of um, their role as distinct from businesses or other types of organisations um, in, in providing that uh, transparency. Um, one of the things I think we're going to be very clear about in the next version of the guidance is that formal reporting isn't necessarily um, required. There are lots of different ways that you can uh, communicate and engage externally with stakeholders um, and we really want to encourage entities to explore what might be the most appropriate form of communication and what types of circumstances. Um, but I think also there's um, a, a real need for us to think about the the, the feedback we've gotten about the, the importance of, of transparency uh, for entities within the UN system and what the guidance needs to say about that. Uh, I might leave my comments there. Thank you, Peggy. Thanks, Katie. No, I, I, I appreciate those, but I do want to give people in the room a chance to. Uh, but Nicholas, I, I promised you a, a 30 second intervention just because Peter had name checked uh, you all uh, on one issue. Would you like to come in on that? Sure. Um, thanks for the opportunity, Peggy. And uh, Peter, really just, and also Susan, just two points in, 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 in response, I think. Yes, uh, well noted the, the role of, of civil society in enabling UNHCR to, uh, you know, effectively implement the guidance when it's adopted. So I can look to try and put that onto our internal simulation agenda. I think, uh, you know, as, as we've been expressing, this is a, a process and, you know, we need to ensure that there are appropriate levels of consensus and comfort within the organization and, and you know, understanding of how we're progressing. That's something that we um, can look to, to think about and perhaps we can talk about separately. And then on the, the data, uh, the processing of personal data, collection of personal data, particularly sensitive uh, personal data, I think that, yes, this is something that uh, is uh, covered by existing policies in respect of the personal data of the people we serve that uh, UNHCR has. I think the human rights due diligence and this guidance is, is relevant to that. Um, we are taking extensive measures to consult more with the people we serve about these sorts of issues in the digital transformation strategy. We did an extensive multi-country uh, uh, 
really quite varied stakeholder consultation about what digital services the the people we serve want us to provide them in the future in short uh, they want us to provide more uh, and so we want to see how we can use that sort of end user user experience research approach to really bring the people we serve into the co-design of the the systems that we'll develop moving forward so perhaps that's an area we can also also discuss in the future uh, thanks a lot Peggy and back to you Great, thanks very much, Nicholas. So we're rapidly running out of time and we're very fortunate to have been joined by the UN Tech Envoy, Amandeep Singh Gill. We're gonna take a couple more comments and then come back to you, Amandeep, if that's all right. Um, we have several people in the room and online. We have about five minutes for additional comments. So if everybody can keep them to one minute and we'll try to get at least five of you in. Um, I saw a hand in the back there, please. Hello, hi, thank you so much for a very interesting presentation about the work that you're doing around the due diligence guidance on tech. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm from the Danish Institute for Human Rights. I work as the responsible value chains program manager um, and also work within the area of human rights and business and technology. Um, I have a few uh, comments, I'll try and keep it as brief as possible. So first of all, uh, to Katie Shavin, and hello Katie, we know each other from the past, but just uh, great to hear that you're stating that you're looking at already existing tools and resources for uh, human rights impact assessment, risk identification, etc., within the area of tech and how they could be applied by UN entities. Um, we have done a lot of work in that area and uh, happy to also discuss uh, afterwards how we might be able to apply some of the, the work that we've been uh, working on also together with partners. And then um, just a comment to, to Peter's uh, intervention that um, he raises a lot of very pertinent points and including the uh, changing regulatory landscape, also around uh, the Human Rights Due Diligence Directive, but of course we're also seeing a lot of regulatory developments around tech specifically, and a lot of discussion around how these uh, tech policy developments at the EU level are linking, um, but also in other uh, countries, but especially at the EU level, how they're linking to broader efforts to support uh, human rights due diligence of private entities, but also uh, the state in which it uh, meets its duty to respect human rights in the context of business-related um, activities and impacts. And then I just wanted to mention also uh, when it comes to kind of understanding the ecosystem and different uh, roles and responsibilities of various actors within the digital ecosystem, um, the Danish Institute for Human Rights together with the Global Network Initiative, uh, BSR and BTEC have also been working on developing um, an outline of the digital ecosystem uh, under the Tech for Democracy Initiative Action Coalition on Responsible Technology and hopefully that could also provide an inspiration and overview of the different actors, roles, and responsibilities that could also help inform this guidance. Great. And then uh, Thanks, finally, Catherine. yes, you just said a that's small four thing. points now. <laughs> yeah, just finally a small point around um, uh, stakeholder engagement and one of the key stakeholders, and I'm here also joined here today by uh, my sister NHRIs um, uh, from different countries, um, and uh, we also have a um, Digital Rights Alliance of National Human Rights Institutions. So national human rights institutions, of course, also centrally placed to create Great. that uh, bridging Thanks, or Catherine. being in that bridging. Function. Sorry, it's just I, I see hands and, and yeah. on the line. So thank you, and I'm very glad to have the National Human Rights Commission uh, people with us. So I want to go to Anna from CETA first. Uh, we have a question from her. Yeah, we have a question from Anna from the from CETA about how data collection and risks associated with data collection is included in the draft guidance. And also we had a question from Guy about um, whether the document is available publicly. And I see John there, please, you wanna come here? Um, yeah, I just, sorry, um, have a question also um, re relating to the point that's raised by CETA. Um, just in terms of um, the guidance you're developing, um, how transparent will the decision making be in terms of will you be providing uh, publicly um, information on, for example, how you arrive at decisions around software, software procurement? I'm thinking, for example, particularly in, rela in relation to uh, uh, personal data and privacy. Thanks very much. I'm sorry to be so rushed. Um, I'm sure there are other comments, but I do want to give uh, the, the tech envoy a chance to make some, some remarks. So over to you, Amadeep. Thank you. 
Thank you, Peggy, and thank you for giving me some moments to catch my breath. Um, so I'm sorry I missed the initial part of the discussion, uh, but I just uh, wanted to underline uh, our support for uh, this very important effort. Uh, this is uh, a theme that was mentioned in the high-level panel on digital cooperation 2019 and then in the roadmap. And uh, I'm happy to see uh, the progress in terms of the uh, draft uh, due diligence, but also happy to see that this is fitting in nicely with uh, one of the uh, key themes for the Global Digital Compact, uh, which is uh, uh, protection of uh, human rights online, uh, and also which relates to this aspect of sharpening accountability for all those who may have responsibilities related to human rights, whether they are aware of them or not. Um, these instruments, um, there are process issues uh, in developing uh, due diligence. The transparency was mentioned. Uh, uh, you know the the internal UN usage of these, uh, how we are able to communicate that better, how we are able to keep them updated, uh, because if it's just a one-shot thing, and then during the deployment of certain technologies, particularly data-driven. AI systems, uh, things change. Uh, what works in the sandbox may not work the same way when you take it to scale. So we need to keep an eye on um, the life cycle consequences. Uh, and uh, this uh, due diligence cannot therefore be just a static tool. It has to be a dynamic uh, tool. Um, it has to uh, also keep in mind the evolving uh, regulatory and governance landscape. Because at the end of the day, UN entities operate in jurisdictions, legal jurisdictions, uh, where there are certain considerations related to digital governance. Uh, data was mentioned by our colleague from CEDA. Uh, so I think that uh, would uh, clearly be important uh, as well. Um, one last thing I want to mention is that um, it's important to have these discussions in the digital context, but we should never give in to the idea of digital exceptionalism, uh, where we start to kind of uh, go down this path of this is a special place. So special considerations apply. At the end of the day, we have to be a little fundamentalist about human rights that you know, uh, no matter what happens, uh, they are paramount. Uh, human rights offline are human rights online. There are no special considerations in terms of the responsibility that is there. We may have certain issues in terms of how we implement um, uh, human rights uh, online and who's responsible and how is that responsibility linked back to the fundamental responsibility of uh, states that have signed up to uh, human rights uh, governance. But let's not give in to exceptionalism uh, because you know there then we are on a kind of slippery uh, slope. Uh, so to conclude, uh, really glad to see the progress that's being made and uh, congratulations to our colleagues uh, from the High Commissioner on Human Rights. I uh, would continue to work with you closely to make sure that this is uh, done. Thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to have uh, the Tech Envoy in place uh, and with such uh, impressive support and expertise that really adds so much to, to our work in this area. And, and having that high level engagement and support is, is really crucial to make sure that this process delivers what we're looking for across the UN system as you've described. Um, we've largely run out of time. I'll beg your indulgence to be able to go back to, to Katie one more time just because we did have some additional questions and want to give a chance to reflect on them. But I know some others may have had comments or concerns or questions. Um, I didn't formally introduce Eugene Kim who is also here with us and has been a, a moving force behind pulling this panel together. To, so thanks Eugene for that. Um, but also is, is working with the team in Geneva. So happy to stay, stay after and take any additional thoughts and comments. And, and obviously um, Katie and, and Scott are on standby as well for those who didn't have a chance to come in and apologies for that. Um, over to you, Katie, for any final remarks, please. Thanks, um, thanks Peggy. I'm just gonna jump in for, for Katie as she um, handles a, a childcare issue. But I just wanted to really thank um, 
thank the SG Zenvoy on, on technology for those uh, for those remarks, which I think are really helpful in framing this in the, the bigger picture. I know we're out of time, but I did want to just clarify um, that indeed the uh, the draft document uh, version three is available to all. It's been circulated with all stakeholders through the SG's roundtable, 3A, 3, 3B multi-stakeholder group. Um, we're posting it, uh, we'll post it again in, in the chat um, just now. Um, and certainly, uh, I don't have time to address all of all of the questions, um, but I think I would just note that a, a cross-cutting theme is that the Secretary General, in, in mandating our office to, to carry out this piece of work, was very clear in asking us to hold consultations with those most affected by the UN's use of digital technology. And so we have been determined, and, and a shout out to Access Now for facilitating, um, very determined to, to consult through a multi-stakeholder process and through the vast network um, of, of civil society partners uh, in the Global South that uh, Access Now has cultivated over, over the years. So just a shout out to, to them for allowing us to, uh, to partner, um, I think, to try to reach, indeed, those most, most affected. Peggy, I know we're out of time. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that if, if, if that's okay. Thanks. Great, and I, I realize we didn't have a chance to go in depth on some of the comments made, but but obviously the door is open in terms of the ongoing conversation with the team, and and I know you are all waiting with bated breath for that fourth draft, as as I am as well. But um, obviously, as as Scott uh, outlined the timetable at the beginning, we're really hoping to see movement on this in the in the first part of uh, 2023, and then uh, taking in mind Peter's earlier comments about uh, the need for this to be in place decades ago, um, really hoping that, that uh, and taking in mind the Tech Envoy's comments about the fact that we will, it will be a continual process of learning as we move forward on this as well, looking forward to, to moving the UN forward on human rights due diligence in, in the coming year. So thank you all for your active uh, listening and engagement on this issue and looking forward to more of it in the future. Thanks again.